Let's go. Let's start from uh, uh, microphysical processes. So each microphysical process has its fingerprints, so to say, on the fields of polarimetric variables. And it's very instrumental for meteorologists to recognize the impact of uh, any of those uh, microphysical processes on, uh, on the polarimetric variables. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, because those processes, they, they reflect uh, uh, very important uh, changes in the uh, precipitation formation, generation, and, uh, and so on. Uh, it's well CP. Okay. Uh, there is a list of different microphysical processes that uh, uh, define and determine the uh, precipitation formation in both convective and stratiform clouds. Uh, this, uh, these three, including differential sedimentation, size sorting due to vertical air motion, size sorting uh, in the presence of wind shear, those uh, belong to the class of size sorting uh, uh, microphysical processes. Uh, then uh, there is evaporation uh, of raindrops if uh, rate of humidity is less than 100%. Uh, evaporation of crystals as well if, uh, uh, the, uh, if there is uh, subsaturation with respect to ice. Uh, deposition rounding aggregation of snow particles is a very important process that uh, processes that uh, shape the distributions and the density of uh, uh, snowflakes that eventually melt and uh, make raindrops. Dry wet, uh, uh, dry wet hail growth, melting of snow, melting of graupel hail, coalescence break up of different uh, uh, particles within the melting layer and also in, uh, in rain. And also freezing and freezing, uh, freezing rain, icing, all these uh, important things, and uh, this one uh, directly related to uh, dangerous phenomena uh, associated with the uh, inclement uh, winter weather. What differential sedimentation is? It's very simple. You know, whenever the cloud forms, and it usually starts forming maybe three, four kilometers above the freezing level, any convective cloud, okay. Uh, it simply takes longer for small raindrops to reach the ground. So bigger raindrops that are formed during this some coalescence process, whatever, okay, they simply fall faster. That means that at the, during this transitional stage of cloud development, so we have more uh, bigger drops at the lower edge of the cloud. Okay, finally, when these uh, small raindrops also reach the ground, there is no difference. So it basically becomes a uniform distribution, more or less, uh, across the whole cone of precipitation. All right, but uh, again, here we expect much more big drops than small drops, and it should manifest itself uh, in the increase of differential reflectivity which is an uh, uh, indicator of the uh, median size of raindrops. And here are uh, the examples taken from this bomb radar last year. And uh, this is a bright band or something like that, that you see some sort of fallout of precipitation, which is seen in reflectivity. Okay, and if you look at differential reflectivity, the bright band is uh, marked by the, the increase in differential reflectivity. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But the most important thing that you see, uh, you see, you see some sort of icicles at the at the uh, ends of, of this uh, rain streaks here. So reflectivity is very small, okay, because a small concentration of particles. But differential reflectivity is quite high. Okay, this is a typical situation, and this situa situation may change quite rapidly because in just in five minutes. Okay, when the precipitation reached the ground, first, I mean, the massive amount of small raindrops reached the ground. Okay, now we don't see much difference of this sort. So we have uh, some sort of a 
relatively uniform distribution of the uh, of differential reflectivity uh, through the whole depth of cloud. That is differential sedimentation. Another example is shown here. It's the S-band data from Oklahoma. That's another remarkable example. So it's rather reflectivity. One of the cells has already been formed, and the precipitation simply fell out here. But another cell just formed over there. And we see some sort of uh, initial fallout of particles here, all right, which are definitely liquid particles. Okay, concentration of them is very small, but these particles are exclusively large particles because the differential reflectivity is extremely high, it's 3, 3.5, whatever, dB. And the uh, cross correlation coefficient is also low. There are two attributes of this uh, size sorting. Okay, so uh, you, you, you clearly see where the transition from uh, from uh, snow to uh, liquid precipitation occurs in this mature uh, cloud, which is in the, uh, in the uh, probably start the, will start dissipating soon. Okay, and this is a growing one. It's a growing one, and uh, there's something that will eventually, in a few minutes, will make something similar to this more mature. Uh, uh, precipitation core with a lot of precipitation next to the ground. Uh, another example from, uh, okay, another uh, mechanism um, for size sorting is convective updrafts. That's we call the differential utility columns, CDR columns. Okay, so if we, um, if we draw a typical, say, size distribution, D, N of D on raindrop, let's say exponential, and quasi exponential. Okay. So, uh, and we place all these raindrops in an updraft. Okay. Uh, because the, um, the velocity, terminal velocity of, of raindrops increase like that as a function of their diameter. Smaller raindrops cannot fall through this afterlife. Okay, they simply stay aloft and they cannot simply fall out through the afterlife. That means that the spectrum of the sizes of raindrops is sort of cut off on the lower end. And we are left only with big drops in small concentration. But what makes all these ADR colors? It's extremely important signature which signifies the onset uh, of the convective growth. Very often we see differential the columns prior to major precipitation stuff. So it has extremely important predictive capability. Okay, so you know that once you see the differential reflectivity column stretching above the freezing level, and there is not much uh, in terms of radar reflectivity, maybe you, there, is, there is surely will be precipitation and, and forming of a convective core maybe 10-15 minutes from that. So it's extremely important for aviation, especially for example, because they, uh, in the busy traffic in the airports, it's, it's very important to know okay, which cells are uh, growing and which cells are dissipating and how just to maneuver the uh, uh, air traffic motion. And here you see this as a uh, uh, examples of relatively weak liquid. There are two, if you look at rather reflectivity, it's the one mature cell that's already developed and produces precipitation okay, uh, on the ground. Another cell that doesn't produce any precipitation at all. There is some increase in, uh, in, uh, in rather reflectivity uh, telling us that there is a formation, initial formation of precipitation occurs at this height. However, look here at this differential uh, uh, reflectivity. Okay, first of all, it stretches above the freezing level, which is about 1.8 kilometers in this case. Maybe by, uh, by less than one kilometer. That says that the updraft is not as strong. Okay, so uh, if we know that, if we, if we see that, and we uh, can develop the algorithm that uh, simply uh, captures this feature, and volume of the ZDR column above the freezing level. 
So that's very helpful for predicting of the further storm development. Okay, but anyway, we have extremely high differential predictivity because we have this up drop here. Okay, and the size sorting occurs not during, due to sedimentation, but usually is very uh, uh, short term. But uh, you can the, the updrafts can be sustainable for uh, uh, tens of minutes, and uh, it's, it's more uh, time persistent signature. Another uh, case for C band in Oklahoma. It's a very deep storm, which is uh, with a height of more than I mean, 15 kilometers or so. And of course, the updraft is much stronger. For this, uh, you know, you know for sure where you have the bright band, where you have the melting layer, where you have freezing level. Freezing level is slightly about two kilometers. And you see how this differential reflectivity column stretches maybe about two kilometers, already two kilometers, as opposed to one kilometer in the previous case. So much stronger updraft, much stronger convection, and uh, uh, it's an important prognostic or diagnostic value of this signature that uh, quantifying this sort of amount of volume of CDR column above the freezing level, you can tell something about the, uh, uh, the potential growth of precipitation and the uh, intensity and strength of updraft. Another uh, cause of size sorting is uh, wind shear. Although it may not be uh, self-obvious from the very beginning. Let's say that we don't have any wind shear. So the wind is the same at all heights. Okay. So, and uh, in the, so, uh, holding frame that moves with a cloud, which cloud moves with some sort of wind velocity. The trajectory of small drops and large drops will be the same. Okay. So there is no size sort in the storm relevant uh, relative reference frame. However, if you have this uh, uh, the change of the wind velocity with height, and this distribution, vertical distribution of winds in storm relative reference frame, so what happens is that bigger raindrops that have larger terminal velocities, they fall much faster and closer to the, uh, ori uh, to the, to the place where they origin, where the uh, smaller raindrops will be lagging behind. So here we have to expect much more bigger raindrops than over there in the wake of this cloud uh, storm. And that's a typical situation, so we need uh, that we, we may not, we may have several uh, of these uh, cells developing, but the general tendency that differential reflectivity is uh, increasing uh, towards the front end of the, of the storm system. And uh, here is a good example of that. First of all, the result of modeling studies which we did uh, using different sort of I mean, models of the, of the uh, wind shear. Okay, so a typical situation is vertical distribution of, of I mean, two-dimensional distribution of radar reflectivity. Okay, so and uh, you see that the maximum differential reflectivity is z, and this is zdr. Unfortunately, it's not marked here. Anyway, okay, so in zdr we have maximum differential reflectivity shifted. Okay, towards the. Uh, front end of the storm. And it's, it's, you see that from the, from the data, you see exactly the same this situation. Okay, this X-band data from, uh, from Bonn. So rather reflectivity has maximum here. Differential reflectivity is over there. So you have uh, quite high values up to 3 dBs. Okay. So from our uh, everyday experience, when we drive through the thunderstorm, just just get into the thunderstorm. So the first drops that we uh, uh, have marks on the windshields are usually very large. And that's every day uh, sort of experienced by, uh, by everything. Okay, in all this, in other words, this is a good evidence and manifestation of size sort. 
So, and here in this particular situation, size sorting is caused by all three factors. First of all, it is differential sedimentation. Because of the, first of all, it's updraft. Okay, the convective updraft. So, the size sorting due to updrafts. However, even the updraft uh, uh, due to differential uh, uh, due, 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 due to differential sedimentation, due to the difference in the vertical velocities of bigger and smaller drops, you see already some even more size sorting. Plus, we always have this green shear, which is uh, uh, the typical situation with this, with this, with this small uh, uh, wind blowing in this direction, this may be blowing in this direction, a typical situation uh, in the thunderstorms. All right. Um, that were a simple situation. In more uh, complex situation, we have not only uh, unidirectional wind shear, but we have some veering of the wind. So not not the uh, magnitude, but also the the orientation of wind vector changes with height. Then we may have uh, more uh, interesting uh, and more. Uh, Mm, uh, peculiar looking signatures. And here is a, uh, this is a so called uh, ZDR arc signature. Okay, that is extremely popular in the United States because it basically uh, uh, suggests the transition from the non supercell storm into dangerous supercell uh, stage of development that potentially can cause tornado. So in this situation, that is typical supercell storm. So the uh, array, uh, wind at lower directions and inflow actually from this direction, just like that. And at higher levels, it's from this direction. So we have some sort of a, a veering. And that results always in the appearance of this uh, extremely high differential reflectivity, just different storms, different uh, data of observations. Uh, uh, which is uh, which is uh, reflected to storm relative helicity. So the meteorologists know what, what this means. Okay. So again, big drops. That means that only big drops falling out here. And rather reflectivity is not shown here, but believe it's very low. Here. So. And once the cloud gets into this stage of development, so uh, that means a dangerous stage. We I mean, have some sort of rotational. Uh, movement there of air and eventually the can can occur. So the good uh, precursor of a severe development and uh, tornadic development especially. So if you uh, summarize the changes of radar reflectivity, differential reflectivity, specific differential phase and cross correlation coefficient pictorially as a result of size softening. So that's what we get. So Z drops down because concentration is lower. Differential reflectivity goes up because big raindrops, big uh, hydrometers result uh, as, uh, uh, during size sorting. Specific differential phase, which is proportional to the concentration, also goes down. Cross correlation coefficient usually goes, I mean, may decrease, as was shown in one of these pictures. But this here is, my students didn't know about that. So I just don't know that was. All right, another thing is evaporation. A very important uh, process, especially dry environment. Very typical for western part of the United States. We have a lot of virga. You see a lot of precipitation in the cloud, but nothing on the sky, because precipitation actually dries up entirely. On the way to the ground, we are dealing with the say, relative humidity is 40, 60, 50 percent, etc., etc. Okay, that that's that uh, presents the big challenge for the radar because the radar samples usually at, at higher uh, altitude. Okay, and uh, it has to be somehow projected the result of that measurement to the ground. You know, the ground can be no precipitation at all. So uh, there are a couple of equations. So. And don't pay attention to that for the time being, but the, but the bottom line here is that, okay, if initial size distribution, like say the gamma like that, okay, what evaporation causes? It simply creates a deficit of these small particles because smaller 
raindrops, they evaporate entirely. You convert the cell to vapor, I mean, very rapidly. Okay, whereas the biggest, bigger raindrops are not much affected by evaporation. So as a result, the median size of the raindrops increases. At the same time, total concentration decreases. Okay, so what, what this causes, this causes decrease in uh, radar reflectivity towards the ground, increase of differential reflectivity, not very big, but some increase in differential reflectivity towards the ground, and decrease, quite dramatic decrease in specific differential phase. All right, so if we summarize it pictorially again, evaporation results in decrease of radar reflectivity, slight increase, so this now is this vector in arrow is shorter than the previous case of size work. Okay, slight increase in differential reflectivity. Decrease, substantial decrease in uh, differential phase, specific differential phase, the relation is somewhat, somewhat ambivalent. Uh, coalescence breakup. You know that in warm rain, most of these big particles in rain is formed by a coalescence process, by collisions between smaller particles. Okay, one of the big raindrops suddenly start colliding with uh, smaller drops and uh, grow by, uh, by a coalescence. So how does coalescence affect uh, the major radar variables? A simple thought experiment. Okay, we have two uh, drops with equal diameters, and when they collide, they make the drop with diameter which is not just two times larger. It's two times larger in mass, but not in diameter. So diameter increased by a factor of two to one third. Okay, so uh, for rain we have z proportional to d to the six, k d proportional to uh, d to the four, about four, whatever. We'll talk about that a little bit later. All right. So at the very beginning we have simply two d zero to the six, and then we now we have one particle, so there is no summation. And once we uh, take into account the change in diameter like that, we'll get instead of two d zero to the six, four d zero to the six. In other words, radar reflectivity increases two times in linear scale, so it's about three dB in log scale. A similar thing occurs with uh, differential phase. Although uh, the coefficient here is from changed from 2 to 2, 6, 6, so it's not, not so much, but also increases. So that means this coalescence or raindrop leads to the increase, and also the particle is bigger, okay? And bigger particles, uh, raindrops, are more blade than smaller particles. So that differential reflectivity also should, should increase. Okay, so the coalescence leads to increase of all Z, ZDR, and KDP. An uh, inverse process, breakup, because very big raindrops may be unstable. So they spontaneously, or through the collision, collision process, they may break up. Okay, and that leads to the decrease of ZCDR and KDP. So again, pictorial presentation of that is like this. Z increases, ZDR increases, KDP increases. Roach, we may drop a little bit because uh, coalescence um, the bigger size of uh, uh, bigger size of raindrops usually uh, result in, uh, in, in a slightly different cross correlation coefficient. Okay, let's get to um, uh, let's get to icing ice stuff and uh, uh, into uh, ice microphysics a little bit. All right, um, to to talk about microphysical process involving. Uh, Ice particles. There is a good diagram from Bailey and Harrod, uh, a recent article, that showing dominant habits of ice crystals as a function of temperature and supersaturation with respect to ice. You know, the supersaturation with respect to water can be cannot be very high. It's usually fractions of percent or something like that. But there can be substantial uh, supersaturation with respect to ice. And again, it's very important to. Uh, to keep in mind that the habit of crystal, the habit of crystal, depends on the temperature where it grows. So if you can see, and also supersaturation, but mainly temperature. For example, at very, very low temperatures, 
we have some sort of uh, irregular uh, shapes of the crystals, not very uh, anisotropic crystals that they grow in spontaneously. Then uh, the most non-spherical particles actually are dendrites that are of plates, hexagonal plates. So they're growing between minus 10 and minus 20 degrees, mostly about minus 15 degrees. So again, depending on ice, ice supersaturation, it can be either uh, plates, hexagonal plates, or plates, or, plates, or it can be a single crystal. This is, a, I mean, a dendrite crystals that has this very, uh, very star-like shape. Another uh, interesting uh, temperature interval is it's about minus 5, minus 4 degrees when those needles or sheaths, okay, uh, or uh, columns are forming. These are prolate crystals, where those type of crystals are oblate. So what we have to expect, that is, we have to expect that, that at these temperatures we may have more polarimetric contrasts, and at these temperatures more polarimetric contrasts. Okay, uh, compared to other temperature intervals. And also, these crystals are growing at very different pace, depending on the temperature and depending on the habits. And it's very important to keep in mind. But here is a very, the summary of a uh, uh, very important uh, observational study of the Kahashi. In a, in a wind tunnel, they, uh, they grow uh, crystals in the wind tunnel and look at the at the speed of growth, okay, and depending on the temperature and where the crystal starts growing, the, the mass can increase at a very different pace. Okay. And again, we are talking about two uh, uh, interesting temperature regimes, about minus 15 degrees and minus 5, 4, 5 degrees. Okay, here needles, for late crystals are growing very fast and vigorously, and here the dendrites are growing very fast and vigorously. And those type of crystals are extremely non-spherical. Look here, we are talking about aspect ratios about 0.1. But here, only ha almost 100. So you can imagine how strong polarimetric signatures, how large differential predictiveness can be if we see these uh, if we see these crystals uh, uh, growing uh, <coughs> at these temperatures. So. Uh, uh, arriving and aggregations are another very important processes, and again, they have the important and strong impact of polarimetric variables. What rhyming is? So, bigger crystals usually fall very slowly through the medium uh, containing a lot of supercooled cloud sides, liquid drops. They are 5 10 microns, they are not raindrop size. 5, 10 microns, maybe 20 microns, okay. So, and uh, during the collision, those drops uh, refreeze on impact with these crystals, okay. So, what happens is that in the crystal, maybe the original crystal have a star form, a very beautiful star form like that, okay. What happens, all these small particles, okay, add mass to this crystal, okay, and uh, actually increase, uh, increase uh, because they substitute some air in this, in this mm -hmm. mixture of ice and air. So the electric constant increases a little bit, and density increases. So and that, um, that why I would say that weaker rhyming is slightly um, uh, increase differential repetitivity KDP. But when more intense rhyming make place, make place, okay, the more intense rhyming, that means that everything is now is filled with this so water. We are uh, so, I mean, uh, so, 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 uh, frozen, frozen small uh, raindrops, and we are getting something like like gravel, okay. And gravel has usually the gravel particle, okay, maybe regular shape or maybe conical shape, whatever, okay. But it's more spherical shape. First of all, okay, and it also it has it has larger size and uh, may tumble more than this than, than this uh, big uh, plate or 
and then drive. Because everything depends on the rain, on the rain number, so the how, uh, how the, the falling behavior. So the particles, the smaller Reynolds number, they, they do not tumble much. Okay. Bigger size particles with larger vertical velocities, they may, they may tumble more and uh, 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 ensemble of these particles is characterized by more random orientation. So that's why I say that uh, ZDR and KDT will be reduced, reduce the result of uh, more spherical shape and tumbling. What aggregation is? Aggregation is when, uh, so here we are talking about ramming is interaction between uh, ice crystals and tiny Olympic raindrops. Aggregation is, is interaction between crystals themselves. In other words, if a crystal okay, collides with another crystal, it can make something like, like this. Okay. And whenever, at the first stage of, it is called aggregation, Okay, the first stage of aggregation. It can make simply, I mean, this quite large but very anisotropic, very aspherical uh, aggregate. And this aggregate, and this aggregate, uh, because of its size, it still has I mean, a large density. Uh, these aggregates are associated with the higher differential objectivity, higher specific differential phase. If we are talking about clumping two or three crystals together. But when we have many crystals like this, okay, adding, 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 adding here, and we have some fluffy snowflakes. That's a fluffy snowflakes that we used to see during good snow, snowfall. Okay. These snowflakes we can tell you, okay, that on average this density becomes very small. The density could be as low as one gram per centimeter cube, I mean one hundredth of gram per centimeter. So because of this drop in density, drop in density, as was shown in previous lectures, okay, the density of snowflakes increases, results in degrees of CDR and KDP. So that's the key uh, physical processes that should be uh, kept in mind. And that's a very good example of the, of the uh, dendritic the growth and aggregation. So it's an example from S band. Oklahoma. Okay, this is a bright band. It's a bright band very clearly seen in a uh, uh, bright band melting layer. So when we have this transition from uh, frozen particles to liquid particles, so marked very well by decrease in the OHV and in uh, and in the rather objectivity as well, not as well and not as good as in the OHV and in ZDR. But look here at the bar in a sub freezing temperatures. First of all, we see strong gradient of radar reflectivity, which marks the onset of aggregation. Onset of aggregation, as was, I was told before, also can be associated with increasing differential reflectivity, when it's just two uh, dendrites are clumped together. And this also can be manifested in decreasing OHV. It's not shown here, but also increasing specific so one, once we see these signatures, another we call it a fade bright band because it's, it increases it's some sort of increasing the ZDR, decreasing the OHV, but it, it shouldn't be mixed up with this real bright band, a real melting wave. So, but once this happens, that means that we that a lot of snow is growing a lot, and maybe in half an hour, in one hour, in one hour, all the snow will fall to the ground. So it's a good predictor for uh, further uh, snowfall development. So the more pronounced signatures like this, so the more snowfall we have to expect. So, uh, and polymetric radars give some uh, uh, now casting sort of for forecasting capability, uh, provide for forecasting capabilities. Okay, so if uh, in the process of aggregation, so again, there is this similar thought example. So we have these two, say, equal uh, size and mass, small particles clumped together, making this again. But now it, the, 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 it's not due to the one third, it was when two raindrops uh, collide and make one big raindrop. Because, uh, the, because uh, 
because the density density of uh, uh, the, the dependence of the density on the, on the size of snow particles is different than, than, than for raindrops. So we started discussing it in the previous lecture. So z is a function of d to the fourth, not d to the sixth. Okay, kdp is proportional to d, and zdr is inversely proportional to d. So, and, and again, once we uh, do this simple exercise, we figure out that z increases again two times, but specific differential phase decreases. It's an interesting thing. Okay. And zdr also decreases because, because the density decreases with, half, with increasing size. So we have uh, aggregation and coalescence of raindrops and aggregation of snowflakes. They have a lot of in common, but they have very important differences as well. So hair growth, all right, it can be dry growth when aggregated water, how hair grows, why hair growth? And we have one, say, small gravel particles, one small, that in, in, initially originated from, uh, uh, from crystal, uh, that accrete a lot of water, and it gets significant size. And now he accretes uh, a lot of more super cool liquid uh, 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 drops. Again, we are talking about 10 microns or whatever. Okay, and now it's a big particle, big particle, and a lot of, and if you have enough super cool liquid water there, uh, liquid water, so then, uh, then uh, this, this water freezes quite rapidly. Okay, and uh, uh, very vigorous and very intensive growth takes place. However, uh, depending on the, uh, depending on the concentration or on liquid water content, and also the strength of the updraft, okay, we can uh, have different processes. One of the processes called dry growth, when all this water just simply freezes. However, and uh, okay, over here, okay, and. Uh, and uh, uh, what happens is that uh, this, this water freezes at the, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, exterior of the particles and uh, uh, traps all uh, air bubbles inside. And what we had, uh, so, so that, 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 and this process leads to lower density ice, which is very cloudy, okay, not transparent. Okay, there is no uh, little shedding of liquid drops in there. However, once the amount of this accreted water increases, and usually increases when the, when, the, the, when the concentration is higher, so liquid water is, content is higher, and also when uh, uh, the speed uh, at, at which water is being lofted uh, is higher, then, you know, at each act of this accretion or rhyming, there is the release of latent heat. Okay, and it can be so much latent heat released that the hailstone acquires temperature close to zero. Close to zero, although the, uh, the ambient temperature can be, say, minus 20 degrees. All right. So if the hailstone has a local temperature of zero, then water cannot freeze. It, it, it's still, I mean, it, 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 it's called wet growth. In other words, we are dealing with water-coated hailstone. So, and, uh, and the film of water is, is building up on them. So that means that that's an interesting thing. So we have a lot of, uh, so we have giant hailstones, water coated, but at very sub freezing temperatures. Um, and again, this uh, process leads to higher density ice, uh, which is transparent. And uh, if you, sometimes uh, you, you, you may have the combination of these two processes. So first, it grows in dry regime, and then after that, it may grow in, in a wet regime. So you see this uh, very opaque uh, the core of these hailstones, and very transparent, very transparent outside. Okay, so. Polarimetric characteristic of hail generally, uh, water-coated hail in the melting or wet growth regime has higher Z and ZDR and lower cross correlation coefficient compared to dry uh, spongy hair that is, uh, uh, that is growing in, in dry uh, 
if the uh, if the cable is dry or okay, it has very thin water coat, then these hailstones are usually tumbling. Okay, their orientations are more and more random, and uh, as a result, differential reflectivity is generally lower than one in red. And this uh, circumstance was used uh, primarily for polarimetric detection of hail at S band, for example. Okay, let's say okay, we have high high rad reflectivity. If high rad reflectivity is associated with high differential reflectivity, that means rain. Okay, but if high Rather reflectivity is associated with low differential reflectivity. That means probably tumbling hail. Okay. However, that uh, distinction is very simple only for, for rain versus dry hail. So once hail starts melting, it acquires uh, water film. Okay, and this water coating tends to stabilize its orientation. So differential reflectivity can grow up dramatically. And these differences cause, uh, uh, cause big uh, 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 similarity, I mean, just differences uh, for S band and C band, for example. So, uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the methods for hail detection and determination of this size, which develop at S band, cannot be automatically and mechanically. Uh, transfer to, uh, to C band because of some uh, 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 scattering effects. We can talk about that if, if needed, but I'm not, I don't have enough time to dwell on that. So uh, very large hail, dry hail, may have slightly negative differential reflectivity. However, it can be that oblate with horizontal dimension larger than vertical dimension. Okay. And then the results of uh, resonance scattering resonance scattering for very large size particles. Okay, and as I already told, I mean melting hail was smaller size they have very high ZDR due to the torus of water and uh, water field that stabilizes the orientation and uh, make it uh, uh, and can make it act as a as a giant as a giant rainbow. Um, melting of snowflakes, melting of snowflakes, melting of grout belt, melting of hail. So the three major processes that uh, takes place that take place uh, simultaneously. One of them is simply change in uh, uh, in the electric constant. Again, from the previous lectures, you know that once the electric constant increases, then differential reflectivity increases, rather reflectivity increases. Okay, and that. Uh, that what makes difference in the polymetric signatures of, say, snow and, uh, and rain. All right, so let's see that we have a bright band. All right, let's see, uh, let's say, let's temperature is equal to zero at this level. So, high. Okay. so when snowflake start falling to the, to the bright band, to the melting layer, okay, First of all, epsilon increases. And these epsilon increase tend to increase rather reflectivity. That's a factor that tends to increase rather reflectivity. On the other hand, when big snowflake melts, a lot of it has original uh, uh, density is small, but once it starts getting water inside, its size starts collapsing. It starts collapsing and the size decreases. So uh, the epsilon, the electric constant, change in the electric constant cause increase in rather reflectivity. Okay. However, the change in uh, change in uh, in the size, because it's very strong dependence of reflectivity and diameter, okay, tends to decrease rather reflectivity. So it's a balancing factor. And another factor is also the size change d. And another factor is that uh, decrease in total concentration due to increase of terminal velocity. Because what happens is usually the, uh, the flow, uh, the, the flux, uh, that means the concentration multiplied by, by, by velocity, is usually constant. It's like in the case of a traffic jam. So you know, just uh, whenever, uh, whenever the, 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 the speed of the cars is much lower, Okay, due to traffic jam, the concentration is much higher. Okay, let's 
direct analogy with what happens uh, um, uh, during the phase transition of the hybrid vehicles. So because of that, uh, terminal velocity of snowflakes one two meter per second. Terminal loss of raindrops that originate from this snowflakes can be up to ten meters per second. So it's, uh, velocity increases in order to make this constant concentration should decrease. So we have decrease in concentration, the radar reflectivity decreases due to decrease of concentration. It's concentration. And an interplay of these three factors is something that makes this the melting layer of the bright back. Okay, so eventually, if you, if you all of you know that uh, radar reflectivity has this sort of profile through the bright back, something like that, and increase and decrease. Okay. All polarimetric variables have uh, even more pronounced uh, extrema with the melting layer, especially differential reflectivity. Frost correlation drop, drops dramatically, um, and uh, like scattered differential phase increase, and uh, uh, everything. So that's uh, uh, that's a well known that's well known uh, manifestation of the of the melting layer in the stratiform rate. So increase in radar reflectivity. Increase in differential uh, reflectivity, very strong uh, decrease in cross correlation coefficient that makes cross correlation coefficient the primary parameter for uh, radar detection, polarimetric detection of the melting layer. And also differential phase, you see some here, there's an X band, for example, of X band, you see some manifestation of backscattered differential phase. Recently, we did very interesting work together with the University of Horn just on, uh, on quantification of this. Um, okay, so if you look at the uh, in the PPI, you will see uh, the change uh, in uh, radar reflectivity. Okay, this may be about three degrees relation angle. The change in differential reflectivity. It's a very interesting signature here. It's a decreasing signature. This is a melting layer. And uh, this uh, example was taken uh, in the case for, for winter case when the temperature actually below the bright band was lower. In other words, we have this profile uh, like this of the temperature. So this is the temperature, this is the height, and the temperature profile was something like that. Okay, when is this? Zero degree centigrade. In other words, first snowflakes melt over there, okay, and then after that, at a certain point, they start refreezing. And it's interesting. Just recently discovered, effect, okay, of refreezing, when the freezing rain over here changes into ice pellets, it's usually associated with the rapid generation of needles and crystals, and these crystals produce. Uh, so-called refreezing signatures in differential reflectivity also seen a little bit in cross-correlation coefficient. Here is a very nice uh, illustration of backscatter differential phase, by the way. You see some increase in the differential phase, non-monotonic dependence on, on, on the radius, and that is caused by uh, uh, differential uh, uh, backscatter differential phase. All right, these are modeling studies. Uh, again, I would like to show this, tell you that uh, so uh, uh, depending on uh, what is the uh, density of uh, snow above the freezing level. So the freezing level, and this is the bright band, so the, the height is being counted from the down from the from the freezing freezing level. So this is a medical profile of Z in the case of uh, unranked snow with uh, a large density, a lot small density, and more rain snow with a uh, larger density. So you see much difference. Okay, the same thing in, in, in terms of differential reflectivity, especially, especially pronounced. So if the in, in initial density of snowflakes is very low above the freezing level, then uh, the uh, bright band signature uh, in terms of differential reflectivity is very, very pronounced and very clear. However, if it's more right, then we may not even have differential reflectivity increase in the melting point. That's 
what usually happens in a, in a convective situation when the extreme uh, 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 extreme case of rhyming, everything is rhyming. We are not dealing with crystals, but we are dealing with proper that falls from the number uh, There is a difference in KDP as well in cross correlation coefficient. That tells the differential that, that uh, uh, in, a, in a melting layer we have a lot of interesting information that can be derived from the polarimetric graders and the melting layers. We used to uh, uh, say that uh, the melting layer mirrors microphysical processes above the freezing level and, and below the freezing level as well. Okay, so if you're talking about the melting of hail or low density, uh, high density hail, we do not, if you look at the radar reflectivities, for example, vertical profile radar reflectivities, you don't see any bright band. You see some sort of increase, increase where shading starts, uh, depending on the so large hair solid line, small solid da dash line. It's a, it's a pretty big uh, plot. But uh, in terms of differential reflectivity, we don't have maximum like in the previous slide. But we have some sort of a step. In other words, the same sort of a increase, almost linear decrease within two kilometers below the uh, freezing level, and then the relatively, uh, relatively stable uh, differential reflectivity, both for high density hail, for small density hail, and for hail of different size and different, uh, 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 different rather wavelength. Okay. So, but the most important thing just to know that the most dramatic changes in scenes in the are covered in two kilometers below the freezing level. So whenever people, whenever people try to detect hail, they have to take into account this tremendous difference between large hail, small hail, and difference in uh, vertical profile, radar reflectivity, differential reflectivity, and all uh, three major radar wavelengths are used for uh, in, uh, in radar meteorology. So it's not easy thing to do. Uh, this is uh, the cartoon that is simply very schematically shown uh, conceptual, that shows conceptual vertical profile of radar variables for different distinction types and different microphysical processes. So in terms of rhyming, we don't have much of uh, bright path. That basically repeats what I said before. Okay. Cross correlation coefficient is doesn't show any decrease in the melting weight. However, if we have aggregation, first of all, we have this good right band, increase in radar reflectivity, increase in differential reflectivity, decrease in cross correlation coefficient. It's a weak convection with no hail, we have this sort of profiles. It's a strong convection that contains hail, so we have this sort of profiles and decrease in cross correlation that's, we have the operation that it uh, differently affects um, uh, the properties of this idea and uh, Summary uh, pictorial. So in the, during the melting, uh, before the, due to melting, Z increases, Z dia increases, K increases, Roachvi decreases. This is very strong decrease that is usually is being used for determining the detecting uh, melting layer. Okay, refreezing. Refreezing also uh, takes place when uh, 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 raindrops are being lofted by, say, convective outcome. And what happened first, I mean, we have some foreign particles. If foreign particles is inside a raindrop. In other words, the big difference in the process of melting and uh, uh, freezing is that melting doesn't require any nucleation or whatever of a particle. So it start, in other words, snow start melting just when snowflakes, slow, slow, uh, snowflake is at uh, above zero temperature. However, the opposite is not true. You know, that's why we have so much super cool water, and if this is super cool water cloud, for window. Okay, super cool water. In other words, for uh, for raindrop to be frozen, it first has to be nucleated. Okay, so it's 
nucleation occurs usually on some foreign body, I mean in the rainbow. And this is uh, that some aerosols that some rainbows may have, some rainbows may not have. Okay, so when it's uh, nucleates, okay, that produces some sort of embryo crystals inside. And then after that, more slower process starts. The second stage of refreezing that may uh, take longer time for larger raindrops than for smaller raindrops. And that's what, what actually defines and determines the essence of physical process in the, in the ZDR codes. In other words, for example, to freeze the raindrop of big diameter under certain temperatures, you need quite a bit of time. So it's time uh, uh, in, in seconds here. So we have 200 seconds, 300 seconds. And during this time, the drop with a super cold uh, uh, drop, liquid drop, can be wafted at quite uh, large altitudes. So that what makes all these EDR holes. So freezing of raindrops, it's, uh, so this is a pictorial summary of that. So ZH usually decreases just because the electric constant drops. Okay, ZDR decreases again for the same reason, KDT for the same reason, OHV, linear polarization ratio, that's rarely measured, but uh, the so-called LDR cap at the LDR cap at the, at the, at the top of the convective arms, that's something that is of interest. And this is a, this slide summarizes summarizes uh, 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 the impact of all important microphysical processes on the tendencies in radar activity, differential activity, specific differential phase and cross correlation coefficient. So good to keep in mind and uh, that, that helps you to interpret for what you see uh, in polarimetric uh, radar measurements. Okay, this topics topic is over, and now we're getting to another topic, which is automatic classification of radar echo using polarimetric radar. All right, so then, uh, the problem in classification of any radar echoes, including classification of different types of hydrometers, is that there is no clear distinction in uh, radar and especially polarimetric attributes between different particles. For example, uh, particles of different uh, microphysical habits. For example, raindrops and snowflakes may have the same radar reflectivity. Okay. Of course, snow doesn't have radar reflectivity of 50 dBz, or maybe only, only wet snow may have that. Okay, and hail may not have, sometimes hail may have very low radar reflectivity, maybe 40, 45 dBz. Okay, so there are a lot of overlapping. If we, uh, if we simply, uh, say, make um, probability distribution of radar reflectivity in rain and snow, wet snow, dry snow, crystals, graupel, and, and, and so on, so we'll see a lot of, a lot of overlapping. And this example of uh, the situation uh, when rain and snow, say, mix together. So, uh, radar reflectivity and differential reflectivity, okay, the whole rain is between these two lines. So, very wide distribution of that. For dry snow, we usually have very, uh, uh, very um, <coughs> seldom have radar reflectivity of more than 40 dBz, but anyway, there's a lot of overlapping between what uh, we expect in rain in terms of Z and ZDR pairs and what we expect in dry snow. Crystals have high differential reflectivity but much lower radar reflectivity, so this it sticks out a little bit. Okay, wet snow, again, it tends to be uh, more, uh, produce more intense uh, radar echo, Okay, maybe higher in the differential reflectivity. We have a lot of a lot of overlapping. And uh, how to if you have only one variable, radar reflectivity, for example, 
that it's almost impossible to distinguish between those networks. So once we have multi, really multi-parameter measurements, then we can apply the so-called fuzzy logic approach. And I will explain later how it works. But uh, uh, here is a, a summary of advantages of fuzzy logic approach. So overlapping, we can uh, do classification even in the presence of overlapping of different classes in the parameter space. So Z, DTR, approach V, KTP, etc. All right. Plus, whenever we are talking about, uh, also uh, additional fuzziness is introduced by measurements because the differential reflectivities has a good measurement uh, error and usually it's quite noisy and noisiness is uh, very visible in the data. The same thing in cross-correlation coefficient specific differential phase, especially for uh, uh, lighter rain or uh, small concentration of hydrometers. So there is an intrinsic fuzziness that's already embedded in our measurements. And it's very natural to uh, uh, embed this uh, fuzziness caused by measurements into the radar variables, uh, in, into the framework of this fuzzy logic approach. Okay, then this provides more flexibility uh, and also it allows to assign different confidence factor to different various types of measurements. And uh, if we know that uh, one measurement is not reliable, it's not, it's, the quality is good, we can also give uh, these measurements smaller weight. Or if we know that one measurement, like differential, it doesn't provide good distinction between, say, two uh, certain classes, we can make lower way to this measure. So it's very flexible algorithm, as will be explained later. Uh, at the moment, what is being uh, implemented operationally in the next rack, in ATAD, that's, that's now it's been growing at very fast pace in the United States, the, the network is almost half of the total network is being polarized. Okay, then 10 classes have been selected, okay, between which the classification is made is ground cloud and anomalous propagation okay. non-meteorological class another non-meteorological class biological scatterers at the moment we don't disti make distinction between insects and birds but eventually it has to be done because uh, insects are passive traces for turbulence passive traces, traces for winds and they in a, the a clear air echo from insects are very useful for measuring winds Whereas birds have their own strong component of velocity and they cannot be used for uh, estimation of uh, winds in atmosphere. All right, uh, the dry aggregated snow, wet snow, crystals, grout, big drops, by big drops we mean rain, rain but uh, which is dominated by the presence of big drops so probably would be more accurate to say in the absence with a deficit of small drops like Typical situation in the upgrounds, for example. And this is sort of BD, it's more stay maybe good to say it's for convective upgrounds here. Uh, rain, that means that light, moderate rain, heavy rain, we distinguish between these two categories because heavy rain presents some uh, uh, public concern very often. And hail, possibly mixed with rain. So at the moment, it's just one category heavy rain mixture. But we are working hard on trying to split this category into the hail or at least three different <coughs> categories. Say so less than one inch between one inch and two inch, and more than two inch in giant hail. And then we achieve some progress. On that. There are uh, six major variables that are being utilized for this classification. So 10 classes, six variables. So radar reflectivity, differential reflectivity, cross-correlation coefficient, specific differential phase, and also textures. What is what texture means texture of rather reflectivity, texture of differential phase? What is meant by texture? For example, if we uh, uh, looking along the radial uh, at rather reflectivity dependence on, on, on range uh, from the radar, you see this sort of you see some sort of a trend that relates something uh, physical uh, um, uh, show show relation relation to intensity of the storm. Okay, on the top of that, we have a lot of these fluctuations. Okay. And those fluctuations can be very different in a, in a ground cladder, can be very different in, in, in meteorological echo, for example. 
All right, so what we do, we take some sort of an average, grand average of that, okay, and uh, remove this thread from that jet of dependence. And I left with a sort of a more or less stationary, specially stationary process with average close to zero, and we take uh, the, the estimate of the standard error of this process, in this case about 2 dB. All right, and we do this averaging window of so one kilometer for to estimate standard uh, uh, deviation of radar reflectivity, an average window of two kilometers to determine standard deviation of specific differential phase. Okay, that's what is being uh, currently used in an excellent classification now. All right, then the basic uh, basic of the algorithm. Just I would like to students to uh, watch this carefully and draw attention to them because one of the projects will be on the classification, basically. So this is a very simple example. Let's say we have three classes: uh, rain or meteorological scatterers, ground clutter, and biological scatterers. And let's say we have. Uh, um, five or maybe three radar variables. Okay. So then uh, the fuzzy logic algorithm starts with the definition and determination of the so-called weighting function. The weighting function is sort of a uh, probability density function that characterizes the distribution of certain parameters, for example, radar reflectivity. The J state may say, may say for radar reflectivity, or differential reflectivity, or cross correlation coefficient, and standard deviation or single standard deviation FDP. Okay. So we usually use this sort of trapezoidal functions to characterize this, uh, characterize this uh, uh, to characterize this membership function. And the trapezoidal functions are uh, convenient because they can be parameterized by four parameters, x1, x2, x3, x4. Okay, what this means, let's say we have z here, z. Okay, z, measured z is over here. All right, this is, this is a value of measured z. Okay, we look at this function, we found one. Okay, that means that for the, for the class, okay, let me, let me for a different way. Okay, this is the, say for example, uh, uh, Weighting a uh, membership function for rain. Okay. So, and here we have some measurement for rain. That will be explained more in more detail in the subsequent slides. Okay. So it can be have either one value of one if radar reflectivity is typical for, for the one for rain, or whether it's too low to be typical for rain, or too high to be typical for rain. The corresponding membership function is equal to zero with some sort of a shoulders here and slopes. All right. Then what is being done for for each gate, for each pixel, whatever resolution grid, so we are computing aggregation value for a second for, for a second class, for example from ray. Okay. And this is uh, for, for rain, for ground clutter, for biological scanners, and so on, as a function of the values of membership functions corresponding to different radar variables. And uh, that will be explained, okay, this is, here is a, uh, here is a uh, typical uh, uh, membership function parameters for meteorological echo to plus non-meteorological echoes, all right, that, uh, that uh, will be used in one of the projects, by the way, so uh, I should draw attention to this slide. Okay, this says, says for example, that uh, the parameters of that trapezoid, the parameters of this trapezoid, x1, x2, x3, x4, which are shown in this table. That means for ground clutter and AP, x1 is equal to 15 dBz, x2, 20, 70, and 80. For biological scanners, we don't have very high values of radar reflectivity, so the maximum is 30 dBz, but most likely between 10 and 20 dBz. For meteorological scanners, again, we have very large span of radar reflectivity from 10 to 65. However, if you talk about the ZDR membership function for ground clutter and uh, uh, anomalous propagation, the ZDR tends to be more negative than positive. So that means that we have the values uh, determined like this. 
Whereas for, say, for A, we have some dependence on these variables and other effectivity. It's actually not one-dimensional problem, but two-dimensional problem, Z and ZDR. So Z is using as a parameter here for the, uh, for the for that membership function. And biological scatterers, well, biological scatterers can make a very high differential effectivity, which is much higher than for uh, ground water and much higher than for meteorological scatterers. So that, that's what's happening. So for which we need, again, uh, there's very small values for ground clutter, very small values for biological scatterers, and uh, uh, very high values for uh, mythological scatter because it was mentioned several times in the course. Uh, the cross correlation coefficient, the magnet cross correlation coefficient, is very really high for, for mythological scatterers. Then there is a simple example how it works in real life. All right, let's say that we have um, uh, this is a membership, typical membership function from the previous from the previous table. So you can find out all these uh, parameters here. So for rain, this is a rain membership function. This is a uh, ground clutter anomalous <coughs> biology. Okay. For rain, that's that's the membership function of for rather effective. And this is a membership function for biological scatterers, low reflectivity. And this is a membership function for uh, for what is this? What is the okay. I'm sorry, this should be, this should be, that, that's, this should be blue. I apologize. I don't know why. Should be blue. Rain should be blue. Okay. So, for rain, cross correlation coefficient is very close to 1. Okay. AP, biological, in terms of raw machine, etc. Okay, let's say at certain point, at certain point, we have this set of measurements. A set of pixels, a second range here. Z25 degrees, ZDR 3 dB, ROHV 0.955, standard deviation of Z5 dB, and standard deviation of Z dB, 35 degrees. Okay. So, uh, if we look at the membership function of uh, rather reflectivity, let's say 25 dB Z, if you look at 25 dB Z, okay. for blue, for red, okay, it's 1, it's equal to 1. Okay. For, with respect to uh, the uh, anomalous propagation, which is, which is red, again, 25, it's 1. But with respect to these biological scatterers, so read the value of this function for 25. It's neither 0 nor 1. So it's 0, 0 0.5 here, just about 0 0.5. Okay. So if you don't use any information from other variables, Okay. This tells us that rain and anomalous propagation ground clutter is more likely than biological scatterers. Okay. Then if you talk, if you look at this differential reflectivity, again do the same exercise and read the, using this slide, you're using this graph, then you will figure out that biological scatter tends to be more likely if you are talking about differential reflectivity only. Give us zero. Uh, 1, 0, and 0 0.5. In cross correlation coefficient, again, this is a biological scatters seem to be most most likely, but followed by ground clan and rain. The same thing for, similar thing for, for this. Okay. What actually for the, the algorithm, fuzzy logic algorithm does, it simply sums up all these values and average them. It sums up actually the, the values, which is what, what this aggregation means. In other words, this summation. This summation. Okay. This summation means. All right. And we're getting actually, when we summarize information from all five different variables for three classes, we figure out this 183 score for A, 3 score for AP, and 417 for, for biological scatterers. Okay. So that means what is the highest score? The highest score for biological scatterers. So from this, using this uh, table and also these graphs, you can tell all right, biological scatterers most likely in this particular pixel. Then we go to the next pixel and do similar type of analysis, and we may get different classification. So that's how it works. 
And again, this one of the first example that I've already shown in one of the um, uh, previous lectures. Okay, so the radar effectivity, differential effectivity, very old example, and cross correlation coefficient. And you see how the uh, information from two additional polarimetric variables complements the one from radar effectivity. Okay, you see that, uh, for example, cross correlation coefficient is extremely high in certain part of the storm, which are not distinguishable in terms of radar effectivity. So the same thing in differential predictive. For some reason, it's sort of a very small way negative here. And when we combine those things together, we come up with the classification uh, results. Okay, telling that in this area, in this area, we have rain, and a lot of embedded anomalous propagation up to 200 kilometers, the extended areas of anomalous propagation echo echo from the ground due to super refraction. So, and uh, everything is immersed into some sort of biota, which is biological scatters, these is green areas. Okay. So, and that can be done with this simple algorithm that was shown, that was shown uh, previously. Okay, one of the projects will be actually on, the, on trying this algorithm for, uh, uh, for the uh, X-band uh, the rest of all day. All right. Take this example. There are different schemes of classification algorithm, and uh, uh, the simple scheme that we already exercised simply simple summation of the membership function. Okay, we can introduce some vector of weights for uh, for certain variables. Let's say variables is shown. Uh, is indexed by J, and the class is indexed by I. Okay, so for example, we have uh, for, for a particular, okay, so the example, we have much less confidence in certain variables. Like for example, differential effectivity is uh, miscalibrated, maybe. You're not confident in differential effectivity. We can simply give them, give a smaller weight. Okay, let's say, all right, we would like to keep in mind this information from differential effectivity. But, you know, we don't pay too much attention to that. And that is being uh, uh, done and just by varying this W. It could be matrix of weight, because, all right, for some uh, classes, we need differential effectivity, definitely. And some, for some classes, differential effectivity may not be very, very, I mean, useful parameter. So regardless of its quality of measurements, it may be not, not be very useful. So, and we can distinguish between, not between variables, between classes, and we can introduce matrix of weight. Moreover, we can use some sort of quality vector, uh, because the same variable can be, may have different quality, say a different uh, distances from the radar, even rather effective. So if the signal ratio is high, so we measure it with much more certainty than if the different if, if the uh, if the noise signal ratio is low. Okay. Or if then in the presence of attenuation. So if the X band, S band, other effective is affected by attenuation, so if attenuation is strong, even after we try to maybe correct for attenuation, we see some residuals that usually increase uh, once attenuation increases. So we may do this sort of things through the vector Q. And uh, this is an example of, say, matrix of waves. Unfortunately, no strict and mathematically justified rules to optimize these waves. A lot of things are ad hoc, off the top of the head, from some sort of a uh, heuristic consideration. But uh, this, 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 this example of matrix of waves that's showing uh, that, for example, uh, for crystals, radar effectivity is important, more important than for, say, ground cloud, because ground cloud is so wide distribution, you know, and for crystals, you have really small radar effectivity. So that, that means that this sort of factor is inversely proportional to the distribution of the uh, PDFs. Okay, uh, then. Uh, that's vector confidence factor of quality vector. Those, those, this, uh, uh, this technique basically 
when I talk about when we get back to that. This is what is being implemented in the next round. This sort of the fuzzy logic scheme that takes into account matrix of weight and takes into account quality vector. And quality vector is defined this way. And there is a, a, a very detailed uh, uh, the paper on the park and analysis. And I will place it on the web as uh, part of this previous chapters of our monograph and also uh, materials. When you can find all uh, needed information regarding this, for example, definition of this vector. But briefly, I will simply tell, okay, there are some, uh, it's, uh, it's formed, it's formed basically as a, this sort of the function of, for so example, differential phase. If differential phase is high, that means attenuation probably is high. So the impact of attenuation probably is strong. And whatever technique we use for attenuation correction, it may fail to some extent. Anyway, we are not 100% confident in that. So that means that we, are, we have to use that here. We have some sort of a threshold for that, whatever. And we use, that means that if it increases, then the Q for, let's say, for ZDR decreases. Okay. Then after that, statistical measurement errors, for example, rho HV. We already mentioned that rho HV is extremely important uh, variables. It's very important to have it very high, so close to 1. So H and D uh, voltages and signals should be very well correlated. However, if it does not happen, that means that the accuracy of differential reflectivity measurements or any polarimetric variables, uh, measurements predicate, is reduced. OK, that means that we check rho HV. If rho HV is close to 1, that's OK, that's fine. So the quality is not suffered. However, it's, it's more than, it's far away from 1. So that means that it is large. Then we have through this exponential structure, we have reduction of this QP. And so on, signal ratio, uh, uh, partial beam blockage, uh, non-uniform beam feeling, those sort of uh, possible artifacts are taken into account automatically. So that's how it works uh, in, the, in the next part scheme. And the full description of that, detailed description in the part paper. All right, another thing, uh, just maybe one slide before I'm missing how much. Yeah, we probably will finish at that point. Okay, uh, it's also important uh, to know where the melting layer is. Because very often, even with all these intricacies uh, and uh, all this yeah. information put uh, into, the, uh, into the tables and all these matrices, uh, it's, very, it's very important to make some sort of simple sanity check. If the temperature is profile is monotonic with high, then you cannot expect snow below the melting layer. And you cannot expect rain above the melting layer. Only if you have updraft and uh, uh, super cold raindrops actually lofted by the updraft. Okay, but it's certain class. All right. So uh, what it says is some sort of a, a set of the uh, sanity checks or class designation uh, depending on the height and the thickness of the melting layer and the distance and also the geometry of random B. Okay. So depending on where we are in terms of range, so um, certain classes are more likely and where we have this bright band, at what height we have this bright band, what is the thickness of the bright band, then we have different, uh, different classes. In other words, some classes are simply prohibited and other classes uh, uh, still be uh, uh, left in the designation scheme. So uh, one and a half hour is over. So we have one half an hour break.